appreciate that. So um, next slide, Steph. Just for the sake of background noise, of course, and um, you know, crosstalk and everything, we'll have everyone muted, but we'll have plenty of opportunity for people to to participate and, and raise hands and unmute um, when we're when we're through the presentation. If someone is joining by by phone, star six will work to unmute. And similarly, to raise your hand uh, if you're just on a phone, star nine works, or just use. Um, the controls uh, at the bottom of the screen to unmute yourself. So um, just introduction of the team, the core team, myself, Pat Hoey, uh, senior planner at, at BTD, and my colleague, uh, Jeff Alexis from Public Works, and Stephanie Suskin, um, who leads the active transportation team at BTD. This is a true collaboration between um, our two departments under the streets cabinet, uh, BTD and Public Works, um, and other agencies behind the scenes, a number of different agencies. It's not just Public Works or BTD, it's Disabilities Commission. It's different divisions within our respective agencies, uh, Signals Division, our Engineering Division, um, even the Parks Department, Water and Sewer. So. Um, there's quite a bit of collaboration. Um, this is the core team leading the project, but um, there are a number of um, fantastic professionals helping out with this, including the design team, um, CSS, uh, Deneen and Kevin are, are both with us uh, this evening on hand to, to help us um, as we present and to answer any questions. So next. So again, just to recap and kind of put things in context, why are we looking at Congress Street now? Um, how does this fit with other roadways uh, that we have redesigned and reconstructed? Well, we all remember the Central Artery Tunnel for those of us uh, that have been with the city for quite some time, or if you have, you've been in the Fort Point, or if you're a newcomer, you remember the Big Dig Central Artery Project. And the scope was huge, but you know, it didn't cover every city street. It was, you know, the corridors and the highway ramps, essentially. So uh, the city uh, took it upon itself to see if we could focus on those intersecting crossroads streets, so to speak, that met the Greenway and um, linked with the Central Artery Project and, and the Greenway and see if we can improve those and bring those up to the standards um, to improve those along with uh, the central artery reconstruction. So there was a number of streets on that list. Three of them have already been completed. Uh, it's Congress's time. Broad Street was, was rebuilt, Causeway, Causeway Street, um, under the Connect to Sork Boston project. We were fortunate enough to receive a grant to rebuild Causeway Street in that whole project. Summer Street was rebuilt a couple of years ago. Um, I think it's uh, it came out you know wonderfully. It's popular for, you know, with its, its, its much safer ped crossings and uh, for cycling, especially. So we were happy the way that, um, and I think the community was about um, the accessibility on Summer Street as well. And now, uh, again, it's Congress, it's Congress Street's time. And uh, that's why we're here this evening. And that's what we've been busy working on. Something we did last time in the meeting, um, I thought it was it, it was informative, but it was you know it was fun to have this interactive participation uh, at this menti.com uh, online polling. It really effective in in getting people's feedback, um, and we have a couple questions. If everyone could log on, put on the code, and then begin to you know fill in and, and, and populate answers. It'll really give us a good idea about uh, everyone's perspective. There's a link to that um, that's in the chat that might be helpful to make it a little bit easier so that you don't have to fumble with your own phones or desktops. But yeah, log on, check it out. And please, please participate. It's, it's super helpful in terms of the feedback that we get.
Do we have any results coming in as we speak? Are they, are they we have anything? Uh... Sorry about okay. that. Okay. Yep. Oh, awesome. All right. We're getting some, you know, ded dedicated civic minded participants that we have this evening. They live and work nearby. I like public meetings, right? We all love public meetings. We have a few more questions too. Um, and then there will be more as we get further along in the pres presentation as well. Uh, I thought this really um, was helpful um, in February on the 28th when we met. Let's see if we have returning participants, newcomers. All right, great. We have some, some folks that, um, that may have missed our first meeting. If you want to go back, for those that missed um, meeting number one on the 28th, that was also recorded. And you can find that if you go to the city's webpage, the dedicated webpage for this site. It will give you a good idea of, of um, kind of what the Q&A was and the concerns and some of the surveys that we had at the first meeting. We have another one that's populating. Any results? Sorry, that one is for later. Or... This is like election night waiting know, to, for the results really... to come in. Um, yeah. The primaries. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> some people are bash. Some people are bashful. They don't want to participate. It is. It is anonymous, right? So. Uh, yeah. I. So sorry. I started can be the as, question. A everyone could be as as honest as possible. Yeah. No judgment. Um, okay. All um, right. Thanks. Thanks for that. We'll we'll, we'll have more surveys. Um, again, um, definitely helpful in giving us guidance and and perspective on people's vision for these for these blocks and for this for this segment of Congress Street. So I, I mentioned kind of the recap of um, you know what we've been doing since February, but this this project goes um, again, as I mentioned, um, it goes goes back to the completion of the Central Lottery Tunnel project with the Crossroads initiative. And some of you, some of you old timers, so to speak, may remember uh, my colleagues, uh, Peter Gorey and John Greeley that led uh, the community engagement and the design process um, predating our participation at this level um, for Congress Street and the Crossroads Initiative. And there were designs that were developed. We had, I, we, we, I think, approached a, an engineered 75% design level for Congress and then kind of put that on hold and we wanted to at least take action on some of the um, real critical uh, elements of what came out of that process. And the first thing obviously that bubbled up was the safety at the museum. And so in 2017, we added that signalized crossing, which was really crucial to, you know, for the families, for the children, for everyone, for the community to be able to uh, have a, a signalized crossing. I re actually remember that before that was signalized, um, that ped crossing, it was the first location in the city where we piloted um, what you see across the city now, the ped delineator, the yield to ped uh, signage that is installed on, on medians. And the first one that we rolled out was actually at this crosswalk. So that helped us carry over a little bit until we were able to install the signal. So that came out of that process. Um, and then, you know, we, we kind of switched gears to Summer Street to focus on summer. There was funding available, completed the design, got into construction. Now we're pivoting to Congress Street. And here we are, uh, meeting number two. After that meeting, we kind of digested, synthesized everything that we heard in the Q&A, in the chat, uh, in the survey, you know, what was what preference people had of the concepts that we, that we um, put forth. And, but we wanted to create, we wanted to um, 
have outreach engage, you know, a cross section of everybody. So we wanted to emphasize uh, reaching out to the businesses. And we spent a lot of time, um, you know, um, compiling a list of uh, every address, uh, property owner, uh, property manager, uh, you know, uh, general managers, um, staff persons that we could reach um, via email, via telephone, knocking on doors, uh, flyering, surveying. Well, we had a business survey. We kept the feedback open for everybody uh, after the meeting on the 28th of February uh, for a few weeks to get additional feedback besides the meeting. But um, we, we spent a lot of time on the ground, um, you know, uh, pounding the pavement, uh, trying to reach uh, business interests to make sure that we were getting their perspective as well, whether it's about deliveries, curbside use, uh, their interests, and couple that with residents, other stakeholders um, that, you know, have traditionally, you know, participated in the evening meetings like this. So um, we put a lot of effort into that. And um, I, hopefully by um, tonight's participation and future participation, we'll hear uh, more from uh, the commercial kind of interests and community as well as the residential. So uh, again, getting back to the surveying that we did and, and you know, tallying up, um, you know, people's thoughts about, about how they use Congress Street today and like what, what their ideal or what the vision would be for the future. And you can see from this graphic, this is just a screenshot, um, you know, it was pretty evenly spit, split on uh, a number of, uh, of uses and just enjoying it as a, as a place. I mean, it is the historic district. It's, uh, it contrasts with some of the newer kind of, um, you know, more modern, um, you know, buildings in, in, in the seaport, you know, next door. So enjoying it as a place, dining was obviously very popular, 23%. Um, and then passing through, um, you know, just, you know, as a, um, you know, a pedestrian or a cyclist or, uh, you know, uh, just a, a resident walking through, going home. Uh, patronizing one of the stores. So um, yeah, it, it was split on those uses. Uh, or there, there, we do have, you know, condominiums. So people do work on Congress Street that registered. But as you can see by kind of the size of these, um, of these bubbles, these were the results. Similarly for the word, um, you know, uh, outdoor dining, walking, biking, walking seem to, um, you know, be the popular response to the survey so um you know we were encouraged by that i mean people really enjoyed uh it was one of the you know positive things um if you can say about um something as terrible as as a worldwide pandemic but the outdoor dining that became popular uh during the pandemic i think is carried over and it's something that people enjoy is dining al fresco uh next slide please So also since the last time we met, um, this, is, this is relevant uh, in the Fort Point, in South Boston, citywide, just it's relevant to, as we look at this corridor and the uses um, and the, the vibe and the feel of, of these blocks of, of Congress Street, um, transit use and how that relates to um, the lane use on Congress Street, the curbside, the streetscape, the urban design, uh, where does transit fit? And since, since we last met, the MBTA, to their credit, is undertaking the bus network redesign project. This is the first time in, in decades, I believe, that the, the T has really taken a serious look at new routes and um, you know, major changes to established uh, bus routes uh, throughout the region. And this uh, illustration is just kind of a by the numbers that essentially it's about uh, increased service, especially on the weekend, as you can see by the graphic, um, you know, something that um, has been missing from in an in often heard complaint is about weekend service. So the T is, uh, as part of this program, is seeking to increase service on the weekends and just bus service overall. 
uh, but also frequency by introducing these high frequency routes where they would run every 15 minutes and then um, you know off hours, right? Uh, not just uh, traditional peak times. And then um, thinking about fairness and, and connecting to vulnerable populations and you know high ridership populations that rely on public transit, uh, trying to reach um, you know um, neighborhoods with with um, populations low underserved and low income. So that's kind of the lens that that the T is is um, is putting forth these recommendations for the network redesign. I encourage everyone to go on. I, I went on myself um, to the T's uh, page to offer feedback, comments, concerns, whatever it might be. Please, um, you know, log on and check that out and offer your feedback because it is relevant to what we're doing and it's all tied together. I can show on the next slide, as a matter of fact, um, you know, what does this mean for South Boston? And um, what's proposed now by the T and, and everyone again in the community can check this out for themselves. Um, don't take my word for it, just um, explore what is in the network that's being proposed. There are uh, two new routes, this, this T12 and T is for the high, high frequency and the T7, um, which would essentially um, marry with the 93 bus, the seven and the 93 and create this, this uh, high frequency hybrid T7. So um, this actually corresponds, if we can go to the next slide, uh, with the city initiative, that's also um, uh, in context and relevant to, to the redesign of, of this stretch of Congress Street. It's the uh, North Station to the South Boston Waterfront um, uh, um, planning project and, and, and design essentially for uh, infrastructure and streets and the route and the connection that um, potentially these new routes or existing could use uh, on city streets. So this is again, you know, in unprecedented cooperation between uh, the city and the T. Uh, this is underway now, there was a kickoff recently. There's, a, there's a, uh, a, I think an engagement pop up uh, coming up in June. And um, it's in sync with what the proposal is, um, not just in the Seaport Transit Plan, but in the uh, bus network redesign program that um, we would take our queue under this project for the proposed routes and linking this uh, Charlestown to South Boston uh, corridor. Next slide, please. So just, I wanted to just have the recap and kind of just a little bit of context before we really get into the meat of the presentation um, and get into, you know, our um, design plans themselves. And what we have next is, just, I wanted to, and I'm, I'm so happy that she's on the team, uh, my colleague, Stephanie, who I'm gonna hand this over to in a, in a minute, but Stephanie does so much good work for the city and she leads an amazing team putting projects in the ground and uh, i'm just so happy to have her on board this project uh, to help us uh, in a number of different ways but bringing uh, her experience and talents to this project in terms of how the city designs streets why uh, what's important what we prioritize our policies how that works with what communities would like to see and what neighborhoods would like to see in their own um, on their own streets. So without further ado, I wanna let Stephanie take the next slides and kind of get into uh, setting the stage for, for Jeff who will follow as we, as we discuss um, an alternative that we have tonight. So Stephanie, go ahead, take it away. Thank you, Pat. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to spend some time just talking through a bunch of the different pieces of the street that we think about as we are uh, designing. Um, and by we designing, I mean, we give information and direction to our wonderful consultants at CSS, HDR, and McMahon um, to help our the vision that is informed by the neighborhood um, come to fruition. Um, so last meeting, we had a lot of conversation about traffic and how we're going to design for traffic and, and what Congress Street 
needs to be um, in the network. And so I thought I would just start with that tonight. Uh, so I pulled some data from 2019. This is pre-pandemic. Um, so you can see um, during the peak hour in the evening, which is the busiest time on Congress Street, um, we have about a thousand vehicles going through. Um, uh, slightly more folks who are leaving the neighborhood, not surprising uh, because it is the evening peak um, and heading you know, towards the ramps or elsewhere um, in South Boston. Um, but uh, these volumes aren't uh, unusually high or anything like that, but we do use this information when we design our intersections. So in addition to knowing about the vehicles and how they're turning and putting all of that into a model, uh, we are uh, also thinking about all kinds of other things. Um, you know, have there been crashes and near misses? Are there things that are nearby that people are trying to get to, um, like at the Children's Museum when we put in that crossing? Uh, we also think about sight lines and visibility and making sure that people who are in the intersection can see each other and know what's happening. Um, and then, you know, we don't want to create any new crashes or um, near misses to the best of our ability, especially ones that could. Uh, cause serious injury or fatality. Um, so we want to think about how we manage how everyone's moving through. Um, and then uh, I, I'll talk a little bit more about like our limited street space. Um, but in Boston, you know, the streets are what we have. Um, that's how much space we have. Um, there are very few places that we are able to add more space to streets. That's something that we did a lot of in the uh, 60s and 70s. We don't do that anymore. So we're trying to make the best of what we have, both for today and going into the future. And then we have a number of national, state, and local guidance that we follow. Uh, we are always keeping on top of new research and best practices and trying to incorporate that into our work as well. So it's a lot more than just thinking about the volume of people, although that is one factor. Um, so we do design intersections for a normal day. So it's not a day when there's a ton of construction that's blocking things up. Um, it's not a day when the Red Sox have a game. Um, but you know, your average weekday, we tend to look at numbers from uh, September, October, or like April, May of the year, where we still have that traffic from school activity and um, we have a slightly higher population of people in Boston. Um, and then, um, but what we really like have to think about is like on a normal day, like this is what Congress Street looks like. Um, you can go out there uh, in the afternoon, you see a lot of pavement, you don't see a lot of trees, um, but that's, you know, what it is all the time. We don't get to change that. What we do get to change is how the traffic signals operate during the day. So um, each time that the lights go through there, um, the green and red cycles and the pedestrian signals come on and off, that's called a cycle. Um, and during busier times of day, we can make that cycle length longer. And that helps us process more people um, and we can sort of modify it, um, our cycle to you know, give more priority to people, to heavier movements than others. Um, but then during quieter times, we can shorten that cycle um, so that there's less wait time, especially for pedestrians, um, and just kind of tighten things up. But again, this can change and grow during the day and shrink um, in the off peak, but the street is always the same. Um, it is always this much space, about 75 feet. Um, and so we need to do the best that we can um, with that. Um, in the middle of the street, like in between intersections, we don't need as many travel lanes um, because there's flow. Um, it's kind of like a slinky that comes behind as you're moving through. Um, you don't have as many conflicts. You can also see people tend to cross the street in the middle of the block um, sometimes to avoid some of that turning traffic. Um, but then at the intersections, we can add like more lanes. Um, we can add our left turn or right turn only lane, um, a through lane, a through turn lane, um, and that can help us improve operations, um, but it could also help us 
manage some of those conflicts between turning vehicles and people who are going through. Um, and then just sort of reinforcing, you know, we want to be really thoughtful about how we're using the space, no matter what time of day it is, um, because when we have so much space, we get a lot of speeding. Um, and so this is just a quick snapshot of um, Congress Street um, speeds, and you can see that you know, there's a pretty consistent level of speeding throughout the day, even during the peak times. Um, and in fact, you know, that like 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m. even has the most number of people who are exceeding the speed limit. Um, so it is really important to us to make sure that people are safe on our streets. And speeding is uh, one of the um, biggest reasons that people um, are seriously injured or die from traffic crashes. Um, we also think a lot about accessibility. Uh, I like to always approach projects from thinking about people with disabilities first and how they might encounter the space and use it. As a city overall, we are working towards uh, what the Disabilities Commission calls systemic accessibility. And that means uh, and every aspect of life um, is accessible. So for us in the streets cabinet, we think a lot about accessibility in terms of transportation. Uh, and we're always trying to exceed those minimum requirements um, from the federal government and from the state government about how we comply with people, with the needs of people with disabilities um, and really trying to make it better. Uh, by making it better for them, we actually do make it better for everyone else. Uh, and safer. A few things that I want to touch on because I'm sure it will come up in the design. So we're really big on smooth concrete sidewalks wherever possible. These are much more comfortable for people in wheelchairs. Uh, they also aren't confusing. Sometimes patterns, if you have low vision, it can be really tough to understand if that's a hole or stairs or something else. So we like to have some um, predictability and clarity and what that like pedestrian space looks like. Um, concrete is also the easiest for us to maintain uh, in terms of, you know, our sidewalk quality, we can do one flag at a time to fix it. Um, and it also doesn't get slippery, which can be frustrating for those of us who are um, able bodied, but people with disabilities. Um, uh, it, it can be really dangerous or, or life threatening even. We also think a lot about curb ramps and where they go and how they fit. Um, so again, we have state and uh, national guidance that directs us on how to design curb ramps the right way. It can be tough on our streets to, to meet those uh, requirements though. And so a lot of times what we're thinking about, especially in projects like this as such pedestrian areas are, what can we do to go above and beyond these minimums to really make it comfortable and accessible? What are some of the design treatments that we can use to make it easier to build these ramps that are really good for people with disabilities, uh, whether they're in a wheelchair or they have a visual uh, disability um, to get around? Um, and then sort of transitioning a little bit here, but um, it's really important for people with visual disabilities to be able to tell when they're entering traffic, whether that is vehicular traffic or bike traffic. Um, and that's when we use uh, this detectable warning strip. They're usually yellow. In some cases, they're red, but the yellow is uh, proven to be the highest contrast for people with low vision. They can really understand that and like be able to tell for sure that they're entering um, a street um, or an area with traffic. Uh, and then we extend that idea the entire way along any bikeways that we design. So um, we require two main things. The first is visual contrast and the second is detectable edges. So visual contrast is usually why you'll see bike lanes be a dark um, asphalt uh, bituminous concrete rather than um, the concrete that we would use for sidewalks that really gives it the best contrast possible. Um, and then uh, throughout the city, we, we've been trying out a bunch of different ways to create detectable edges that are the best for our community. Um, and so in some places like on Summer Street, we put a bunch of street furniture and trees, street lights, bike racks, benches, mailboxes, just to help reinforce that there's a separation. Um, but sometimes we also look at things like 
having the bike lane at a different level than at the sidewalk. Um, so there's a real curb, um, or we can try to use a more detectable edge paver um, that uh, folks who are using a white cane can really tell is different. The thing about all of this though, is that at some point we have to use uh, a one standard so that people know what to expect no matter where they are. Um, then for bikes, um, our citywide goal is to quadruple the number of people who, who bike. And so we're really focused on basically two types of bike facilities. Um, those are separated bike lanes, which are bike lanes that are fully dedicated for people on bikes, separate from vehicle traffic and pedestrian traffic. Um, we can build those in a variety of ways. So um, Summer Street is like a full build, um, or you can come downtown and see our, the bike lanes around the Boston Common, uh, and those are more of a quick build using um, flex posts and, and paint. And then the other um, that we use, which is not as applicable for Congress Street, but for some of our smaller streets, um, we like to provide traffic calming and, and wayfinding to help people on bikes use those as part of the bike network to get wherever they're going. Uh, this is a point that I made last time as well, but I, I wanted to reinforce that, you know, Congress Street can provide a really meaningful network connection given um, the other bike facilities that are coming in the area and, and the ones that are currently constructed. So uh, this map just shows where we have bike lanes and separated bike lanes already in the neighborhood um, and where they're coming, which is Boston Wharf Road. Um, and you can start to see how it might be easy to like take a bike to get around, whether you're coming from downtown um, or you're coming from South Boston in, in the neighborhood. Um, and then there, you know, you have a bike share station on Congress Street today. It is removed in the winter time for snow plowing, but otherwise it gets a lot of use. Um, in the season that it's out, uh, so last year between March and November, we saw more than 64 trips per day either start or end, um, which is an amazing number and is certainly much, many more people than would be served by the three metered parking spaces that are there. Um, and then in the peak season, uh, sort of July through September, that number was even higher. That was 76 people served um, by this bike share station every day. Uh, and then I'm very excited um, that we're going to have some opportunity to plant new street trees. I want to be clear that we do not yet know how many or what type or where they're going, um, but we're definitely going to be looking at adding trees. Um, and using best practices to make sure that those trees can survive, um, including using structural soil wherever possible um, to give those roots more space um, that isn't compacted um, and has all the oxygen that they need. Um, we uh, have a lot of trees in Boston for street trees. You know, we are, we have a slightly more limited palette because we have a lot of issues on the street that we don't necessarily have like in a park or on private property, um, including, you know, uh, salt, which is a pretty big one. Um, but we also want to make sure that no matter what we're doing, we're picking the best tree that will survive. Um, and sometimes that also depends on when the project is actually in construction when those trees can be planted. Um, and then you do have 11 trees out there today on Congress Street. All of them are west of A Street. Um, we will be protecting them um, during any construction um, and using whatever techniques we need um, based on what the final design would look like. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit more about outside of the curb. Um, so this is a map of um, uh, the curb uses that were out there. So you can see we have a number of um, restaurants that have outdoor dining. Um, we have the zip car spaces, we have that blue bikes station. Um, and so the remaining parking spaces during that time, we have um, three metered spaces, one meter that turns to valet, we have nine that turn to resident uh, only parking, um, and we have a couple of commercial vehicle spaces. Um, so that's a, a total of about 15 on Congress Street. Um, and then I just want to flag that this is a citywide challenge to manage our curbs uh, where, you know, we've tried a bunch of things over the years, we continue to try stuff right now, uh, what seems to be the best practice is 
um, first of all, accepting that this is something that happens on our street and is going to happen on our streets into the future. Um, this is a change um, that has happened and it's unlikely to go away. Um, and so that means we need to spend more space uh, on short term pickup drop off um, for that type of passenger activity, but also uh, food delivery. Um, and we also tend to put them on the far side of the intersection because people who are stopped for a short amount of time, um, I think universally refuse to parallel park, at least in my experience. So that was a lot of just background information, um, but I'm going to hand it over to Jeff to talk through how we're applying all of those principles and ideas to um, our preferred design for Congress Street that you're all here to learn about. I'm sorry I didn't like have a, a very long speech about how great you are, Jeff, but you are. <laughs> thank, thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate it. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you once again for joining us to talk about Congress Street. Um, 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 our next slide, you can jump to the next slide. Perfect. Um, before jumping in um, to the potential improvements for Congress Street, um, I wanted to go over the roadway conditions as they exist today. Um, as you can see from the two cross section sections shown here, um, along Congress Street, and west of A Street, there are two 10 foot sidewalks, um, a parking lane on the north and south side of the street, and one travel lane in the eastbound and westbound directions. Um, east of A Street, um, there are two 10 foot sidewalks, two through lanes, um, and a park and parking lane um, in the eastbound direction, um, and a through lane and a left turn lane in the westbound direction. Next slide, please. So at our last meeting, um, we shared three different concepts of Congress Street to gain a better understanding of what you all envisioned for the future of this quarter. Option A looked at um, looked to maintain the current and existing functionality of Congress Street, um, with additional space being allocated to the wider sidewalks with room for street trees and outdoor dining. This option also allocated space for metered parking, valet, and loading on the northern and southern sides of Congress Street. Um, in addition to the to these minor improvements, this option proposed race crossing over all the side streets. Option B looked at removing the parking along Congress Street and allocating the space gained from a redesign to the pedestrian route. This concept provide, provides significantly more sidewalk space and would allow opportunities to provide additional outdoor dining accommodations along Congress Street. Option C. Um, looked at removing the parking along Congress Street and allocating the additional space for wider sidewalks and a sidewalk level bicycle facility on the northern and southern sides of the roadway. There's a couple of more factors I'd like to note um, is that on every one of these options shown, um, repurposed space from the right turn lane at A Street um, provided and, and provided race crossings along Sleeper Street, and, and they provided um, race crossings along Sleeper Street, Farnsworth Street, Thompson Place. Um, and still in stream. Next slide, please. Um, so as Pat mentioned, um, the redesign of Congress Street from Sleeper Street to Boston Wharf Road um, has been an ongoing discussion uh, with the Four Point Town neighborhood. And there were several takeaways the city gained from these meetings. Through our discussion with the community and the feedback we received from, from our online feedback form and the businesses along the quarter, we determined that the preferred design for Congress Street should focus on incorporating additional sidewalk space and provide dedicated bicycle facilities in both directions. As you can see from um, this table that we have, or this chart that we have here, um, option C was the more readily selected um, option that, that, that was um, chosen during the meeting. Next slide, please. So taking a look at the typical cross sections, um, first one, which is west of A Street, this design will provide wider sidewalks at grade separated bike lanes with raised buffers and one travel lane in the east and westbound directions. The second cross section, which shows an example with parking, provides a similar treatment to the, the one shown above, but in this preferred design, 
there are and, and and in this preferred design, there are a couple of areas along the stretch where parking can be accommodated. Taking a look at the third cross section, um, which is east of A Street, we have a three lane configuration. We're currently coordinating with MassDOT um, on their Seaport Railways improvement project, improvement project. So this section, I mean, could be subject to change. Um, however, we, we are showing here a, a sidewalk with street trees and street furniture. Um, a roadway grade bike lane with a painted buffer um, and two tra travel lanes in the west westbound direction. In the eastbound direction, we have one travel lane that eventually transitions to two lanes entering Boston Wharf Road um, and a roadway grade bike lane with a painted buffer. And although the sidewalk in this section will vary, we're able to provide a wider sidewalk um, in the eastbound direction as well. Next slide, please. So some key points um, I'd like to mention from this preferred design is that it proposes wider sidewalks throughout um, that provide space for dining, greenery, bike share, and other street design elements. Um, race crosswalks that are proposed along Congress Street that approaches of Sleeper Street, Farnsworth Street, Thompson Place, and Stilling Street. Um, this design improves safety for cyclists by providing physically separated bike lanes. Um, we're able to accommodate an intermittent parking west of A Street and the driveway access east of A Street is maintained. Next slide, please. So zooming in and taking a, a closer look at Congress Street west of A Street, this plan, this plan view might give you a clearer picture of what the preferred design entails. As I mentioned previously, race crossings are proposed at Sleeper Street and Farnsworth Street. You can clearly see how the separation of cars, bicycles, and pedestrians are delineated by the proposal of, of the at-grade bike lane with the raised buffer. Um, taking a look at the, the dashed blue line, um, you can see the areas where the existing sidewalk is widened. Um, and as I mentioned, we're also able to provide three locations um, for curbside access. East of A Street, um, we're able to accommodate the similar, the similar treatments. Um, race crossings are proposed at Thompson Place and Stilling Street. Um, we have the at-grade bike, at grade bike lanes that are separated with buffers. Um, we're able to widen the sidewalks in certain sections to help shorten the crossing distances. Um, we've maintained the, the, the driveway access east of A Street. Um, and we've incorporated an additional crosswalk that was requested at the A Street and Thompson Place intersection. Side, please. And finally, um, I'd like to quickly touch upon the reconstruction of A Street. Um, as part of the Congress Street project, um, we will be widening the sidewalk slightly to provide accessible sidewalks, but only within the limits of this project. Um, we understand that more needs to, to be done on A Street. Um, so we will be continue to engage with the area developers um, um, to update A Street between Congress and Melcher. Um, some of what, what is happening right now, um, and in coordination with 51 Melcher, um, accessibility improvements will be made on A Street from, I believe, believe from around Melcher Street to Summer Street. Um, and in the short term, in the short term, uh, Public Works will be replacing um, the staircase that is south of Summer Street, as well as widening the sidewalk um, in that that um, vicinity. Next slide. With that, um, I guess I will kick it back to Stefan. Oh, Pat. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it from here, Jeff. Thanks for that. Thank you for going through the detailed cross sections and the the layout that we have. Um, you know what we've refined in the last few months since the last meeting. Um, thanks everyone that's on the call for you know, sitting through the, the slide presentation, we wanted to make sure we were thorough and covered every single thing that we really needed to cover. I know it's a lot to take in. Uh, we want to get your feedback. Um, so I'm going to open it up in, a, in just a second. Um, what's the next slide? Did we have any additional? Um, oh, there was, like we did last time, um, any written comments, any thoughts that you want to give, please, by all means, um, you can email uh, this address, um, PWD, 
phd.engineering at boston.gov. Uh, Jeff and the team will, will field that, um, you know, those written comments. Um, that's my phone number there. You could reach me at my desk if you wanted to just kind of talk about the plans. Um, and then, you know, we'll be providing updates, um, you know, uh, as always, uh, keeping current on our, uh, on our webpage, a dedicated webpage. You can sign up for notifications. Um, and that way you'll be kept abreast, even in between meetings about uh, what we might be working on. And uh, we always want to hear from, from, from everyone. So um, please spread the word because uh, as we mentioned, you know, people could watch the recording, they could see the plans, they could comment, even if they weren't able to attend tonight. So um, yeah, let people know this, this was presented. Whoever couldn't make it tonight, uh, they might get a chance. So uh, next slide, I think was on some next steps. Um, yeah, just the timeline real quick before I open it up. Um, you know, we want to take everything that we uh, hear from you tonight, um, go back, uh, continue to, you know, refine the drawings, um, you know, engineer the drawings uh, more with, you know, actually, um, you know, with using the survey, what's out in the street. Um, there's always uh, things that you encounter in terms of utilities and, you know, where the curb lines fall. So uh, we'll refine the drawings, uh, you know, based on additional feedback that we get, of course. Um, and then we're hoping to couple this with Sleeper Street. We've, we, you know, we added Sleeper Street. Um, there was additional, um, funding for uh, a recon of sleeper which was uh really uh, an ex you know the existing condition is not great sleeper street and it was something the community really uh was seeking was a redo of sleeper so we we aim to couple these bid them together which makes a lot of sense to do it at the same time and to begin uh potentially next year to actually be in construction so with that next slide um, before we open up to Q and A. Yeah, um, we've gone through uh, the whole presentation. Thank you again for your kind of patience sitting through and your participation. We have the chat. Uh, anyone uh, can raise their hand. Um, that's probably the best way is maybe if someone wanted to comment, if they could raise their hand and, and just, um, you know, ask any questions or, or you know, give opinions on, on, on what you, you presented tonight on the, the preferred option. Uh, you like it, uh, you know, you need more information, you're not sure. Um, please, by all means, um, let us know. Is there anything in the chat that we wanted to respond to, uh, to the team? Copy of the slides. Uh, we'll be posting these slides, certainly, and we'll be posting a recording of this meeting, right, guys? Yes, Pat, uh, yeah. Um, and, so there was, um, we had some praise from Steve, which is awesome. Uh, always uh, love to get that. That's very welcome. The raised cross crosswalks and changing the view and the look of the street. Well, what, it, what the raised crossings do as they approach, the side streets approach, it's not so much the view or the look. You'll, you'll see a continuous grade, basically. You won't like be crossing like a traditional, um, you know, curb cut for for a roadway entry where you have to dip down and then raise back up right uh at the ramps so with the raised it's continuous uh flush grade essentially anyone anyone else want to add to answer that one about the raised crossings does that satisfy um christina okay the slides um Going down the chat. Um, so we have uh, uh, some comments from Steve who um, needs to stay on mute tonight. Uh, street lighting should be per landmarks approved design. All street light electricals should be below grade per landmarks, although there are currently a few temporary wired street lights overhead in violation as far as uh, Steve knows. Um, so I we'll toss that um to maybe jeff or deneen to comment on i can comment on that the um the street lighting is going to be as per uh, landmarks it's going to be the four point fixture that most of the fixtures are 
the wiring is going to be um, underground and we're we're not at the, the point yet where we can determine whether we need to move some light locations but um, it, it all will be consistent with the um, historic district that this is part of. I am just going to share a different screen very quickly. So just to answer, like, what are our raised crosswalks, especially? I, I can definitely hear, like, if I didn't work in this space all the time, I would also wonder if that means that they are above ground or whatever. But um, in this case, what we mean by raised crosswalks are that they are at the same height as the sidewalk itself. So people in cars go up um, and down instead of people who are walking or rolling or um, you know, maneuvering across the crosswalk. So um, they uh, are nice and flat for people who have um, disabilities, um, very easy um, to just keep moving through there, sort of reinforces pedestrian priority, um, makes you a little more visible to drivers. And when we use them on side streets, like we're planning for um, along Congress Street, it also just helps people sort of take that turn a little slower, enter those side streets at a more appropriate speed um, and keep everything nice and safe. It, it also makes you, I think, a couple inches taller, right? For so me, about, I need it. You don't need it as much, Pat, but so I do. It, yeah. it adds some height, which actually adds to the visibility. So you get taller and uh, you're more visible to the motorist than to Stephanie's point, it can help slow down a little bit on the turning maneuvers, but it's that flush condition that there's no elevation change at all. It's just continued same grade, which is helpful for those that uh, may be uh, impaired or um, just uh, want to, you know, or just short. for everybody. It's fine. <laughs> all right. Um, Hope I that clarifies, it. Christina. Um, so we have a question um, from Thomas about the expected length of time for construction. That's for you, Jeff. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was, I was muted. Yeah, I can jump into that one. Um, I mean, I, I envision, I mean, Congress Street and, as well as Sleeper Street taking one construction season um, to be completed. I mean, if they can get out there in early spring, um, I envision them finishing that finishing it that, um, next year. At, at the latest, I mean, they'll, they'll have most of it done by the end of um, the construction season, which is probably around November of next year. Um, and I mean, if anything needs to be done, I mean, punch list, um, they, they would be able to finish that in um, the following spring. But um, I, I envision it's only taking one construction season. Um, Jeff, you want to? Just in case the question is more about like flooding and, and overall resiliency against uh, climate change and rising waters, um, are there any like pieces of this design that are responding to um, that uh, potential future where we have uh, sea level rise? That's also for Jeff yeah. or Janine, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, my understanding in regards to this project, I would say no. Um, I mean, I know, I know there are a couple of things that we, we kind of take a look at when it comes to like green infrastructure. Um, that may be something that we can visit along this corridor. Um, but for the most part, I mean, we, plantings of trees, um, we're, we're not looking at elevating the roadway or anything like that. I mean, this is all existing um, construction and buildings. Um, so, I mean, it, it's more of, taking a look at what we can do with, with water infiltration. Um, but I mean, that's, that's still kind of up in the air and that's something that we can definitely um, explore further um, for this project. I think, Jeff, you think about the, uh, the lifespan of a, of a roadway like this uh, for redesign and reconstruction, maybe 30 years, right? Or, you know, maybe 30, the duration that it lasts before maybe you take another look at Reconstruction thirty. Do you, do you mean seventy or eighty, Pat? Well, yeah. that's that's more yeah. realistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say thirty to fifty, but yeah. I mean, in in my lifetime, I'll probably be gone by then <laughs> before they make any changes. Yeah. 
It, Valerie's brought up A Street that we talked a little bit about in the slides. Um, very important um, yeah. question about the A Street scope of work and the yeah. limit of work. So, um, you want to yeah. just yeah, I mean, so so as I've mentioned, I mean, in in terms of this project, I mean, we just don't have the budget and funding um, to make ex extensive improvements on A Street. Um, what we're looking at is pretty much buttoning up this intersection um, and providing, yes, ADA compliant sidewalks, probably within 50 feet from Congress Street. Um, it, it's it's, I mean, we 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 are widening the the, the, the sidewalks here um, to provide. Um, the minimum clearance that we need um, to make it accessible, but um, but yeah, I mean, we're ultimately we're we're, we're literally going to be coordinating with um, um, the developers in the area that are um, proposing to make improvements along the street. Um, there there are some some things that are there are some talks that are happening. Um, there are some projects that are um, are going on. Um, so we're, gonna, we're definitely going to be relying on them to to make these improvements, but. But yeah, we're, we're essentially just taking care of the intersection um, at Congress. Uh, Jeff, uh, the staircase, the staircase though, and some you know issues around the replacement worth yep. mentioning. Yes, yes, um, I, I did also mention that um, the staircase, the staircase um, along um, along A Street, which is I believe it's the, the one at south of Summer Street, um, they need to be repaired. Um, we have a, a new staircase and footpaths um, program. Um, in our division, and then we're taking a look at um, repairing those staircases and also providing an accessible path um, in the vicinity of those staircases. So we're, we're pretty much, we're, I mean, we're improving the existing condition to bring it up to, to code, uh, you know, around the corner, uh, inward on A Street, down to uh, where it meets up with around the st staircase and the work that the city is doing on the staircase. And then the rest of A down to Melcher, is what we're, um, you know, working with the these major projects on A Street as, as mitigation for, and then on Melcher itself, which is really important, it's come up a number of times. Fifty One Melcher has committed to some, to some pretty good improvements for accessibility. Um, we're excited about, you know, their willingness to, um, to really help with accessibility on Melcher too as you as you make that turn. So I think when all these pieces are assembled. Uh, you know, we'll finally get to a place where we've been longing for for quite some time um, in that, you know, those, um, you know, couple blocks. Tom has had his hand up for a little while. So, um, Tom, you want to ask your question? Sure. Thanks. Uh, how you doing? I'm, I live on uh, Sleeper Street. And uh, I just had a question about the, um, the bike lane. Uh, well, a, I'm curious how that poll that you uh, got the information, which option to go with, was that, how, how big was that poll? Like, I never saw anything, uh, you know, to give my personal input. I don't know if I, I, I think I missed the previous meeting, so maybe that's where you got it. Uh, but that's one question. And then the second question is, with the uh, bike lanes, um, I used to live on Beacon Street, uh, before they had bike lanes and I put the bike lanes in and I always kind of uh, not really had an issue, but it was, they were never used. Didn't really affect me too much, uh, but I just want to make sure that doesn't happen here. I don't know, Beacon might've changed. Now people might be using it, but uh, but at least for the first two years, they didn't use it. Uh, and then the, uh, the only other thing would be, it was, there were a couple of times when I, I would kind of be looking for cars and I would step in and there was like a bike coming. So that was kind of like a one thing that I uh, like safety thing. Are there are there safety things for these bike lanes? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm sure there are, but uh, those are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, re really good questions, Tom. And um, I could start off a little, and then maybe Stephanie could could pick up. But the um, yeah, we, when we did the last meeting, there was an um, we had a real time survey. Uh, on the 28th, sorry, sorry, you missed that. Um, if you could go back on the, on the, um, if you visit the webpage, you could see the questionnaire. And then, um, but in terms of the, the bike facilities and the usage on Congress Street, we, we did do um, counts on 
for example, just the, the bike share, and there's a significant number of trips uh, that are associated with the bike share station that we do have on Congress Street. And the present condition, it kind of like just dies. Like we have safe, you know, to your point about the safety, like, in, you know, separating the cyclists from the vehicular traffic. Um, if you cross over the bridge, you're protected. And then it just kind of like turns into a share the road. Good luck. Um, so we want to, you know, get, you know, in this plan, we actually have physical barrier, physical um, curb to separate uh, the cyclists from the vehicular traffic to provide that protection uh, that we really need and to encourage more people to use these facilities, right? I mean, I think part of the reason that people, you might not see cyclists on a certain street is because it just doesn't feel safe. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, the Be Beacon Street, I think it's um, a matter of once you, once it's implemented, then you start to see the numbers creep up. I don't know what they are presently up on that corridor, but this, there's definitely a desire line on Congress. What a lot of people do today is they, you know, Congress Street's well protected until you get to the Greenway. And then you just, if you don't cross over the bridge, you know, you, 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 you know, some people just connect on summer because it's just, you know, grade separated. It's really like a pleasant experience uh, on summer because, you know, you're fully separated on the sidewalk. Uh, you're not, you know, competing with traffic. It's not, um, you know, even near you as a cyclist. Um, so similarly on Congress Street with the design line, with the separation, um, you know, and connecting to the network that's being built out, bought this uh, plans for Boston Wharf Road to have facilities that are separated and, and, and much, much safer and, you know, than uh, just, you know, a traditional kind of five foot, you know, pavement marked striped, striped uh, bike lane. Um, so I don't know, Steph, if you have anything to add kind of to respond to, to Tom's uh, questions, which you had good points. Yeah, so um, you're right. I think that more people are using Beacon Street the longer that it's been in, um, but it also uh, is part of a network now that it, it wasn't really before. We're still missing that first block, but with additional um, protected bike lanes um, in the downtown area. I think more people have shifted from Comab over to Beacon Street. Um, the numbers that we collected in September were um, about 300 people on bikes for the course of the day. And, you know, that may sound low, um, but our goal for cycling is not for complete parity with vehicles. I think uh, Beacon Street is um, just about 6,000 vehicles a day. Um, so, you know, it's about 4% of all of the traffic um, are people on bikes and a higher percentage during um, commute times. Uh, Beacon Street being one way away from downtown also has a very sort of more people um, in the evenings riding it than, um, you know, in the morning, uh, just because of the directionality. Um, in terms of Congress Street, um, as Pat mentioned, the bike share station, um, you know, serves while well, it's out there an average of 64 trips per day, um, which is quite a lot of people who are starting or ending um, on Congress Street. Uh, we did bike counts in July, um, and of course it's summertime, so things are a little bit different, but I, um, we shared that in the last meeting and um, the total on Congress Street was about 375, um, and you can compare that to, well, I didn't collect July data on any other streets, but September data we collect every year, and um, on Summer Street, uh, you'll see, you know, 700 plus people on bikes every day, um, which is also about 4% of the traffic on Summer Street, um, but during the, the peak times, People on bikes are, um, you know, five six percent of all vehicles, and then um, Seaport Boulevard is also a really um, strong bike connection for a lot of people. We have, you know, uh, September probably around a thousand people a day um, who are biking on Seaport Boulevard, and during the peak times, that's um, between seven and ten percent of all the all traffic um, on Seaport Boulevard. So. Um, we definitely expect that as this network connection is made, Boston Wharf Road is made, um, we'll see a lot more people choosing to bike on Congress Street um, going forward. Um, 
Valerie also has her hand up. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Great, thank you. Um, this really sounds terrific and exciting. I'm going to ask for just a little bit more specifics of where, uh, where A Street meets Congress. Um, the A Street sidewalk there is very narrow and there are um, street light poles on either side that make it impossible for a wheelchair to pass. So folks actually use the, um, uh, the bike corridor, that's that slip corridor um, to get um, uh, safely through the intersection. So in terms of what you're going to do on A Street, and I understand A Street's being pe pieced together from lots of different developers, so it's kind of hard to get one picture of it. But um, in this section, are you going back as far as the, um, the Summer Street overpass? Is it going back that far? Or is it the improvements just going back to the alley behind the buildings on Congress Street? And then um, just again, because of that light pole, will it really become ADA um, accessible? Yeah, I was looking for a landmark with this, um, uh, you know, this diagram. Yeah, and maybe uh, maybe the our engineers, um, the design team, maybe there's a, a survey that this can determine like exactly like are we going to get one foot, two feet? Like what can we? What are we going to gain that we have to work with in terms of maintaining a minimum travel lane? How can you know? How far can we bump out these sidewalks? Right. And Valerie, that that um, the utilities that you know the street light, the fire hydrant where that comes into play how do we maneuver around that in terms of accessibility i think i don't i don't know if we have that um i think I scaled think kevin, out patrick i think kevin can um help respond to this i will say that we don't we don't know exactly where we're transitioning back to the existing curb on a street what's included in this project is the intersection of a and congress street this is the congress street project so you know typically um, we go back up to 50 feet, but if it makes more sense to do it at 40 feet, we would, you know, we would, right. we would do that. We, so we're just picking. There is, there is a pretty six, um, significant alley behind the Congress Street buildings that the neighborhood uses and, um, uh, you know, it's traveled a lot. And I didn't know if, if you would go back as far as, as the alley. It's, and it's how the Congress Street buildings get their deliveries. Um, but, and I just don't know whether that's 50 or 100 feet. I, I, I can't tell. Is it the is it the alley that we're seeing in this um, in this aerial? Um, yes, yes, but, yeah. exactly. That's the alley. It goes right across. So um, that's where the sidewalk gets really narrow. So this project right now is not going to that alley. It's stopping. Oh, it's stopping okay. But it really is just the intersection with Congress. I um, see. Kevin, so it's really not going to have an ADA impact because th that section is so deficient. Yeah. Um, and especially the the um, you know the 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 I don't know southern end that's in shadow. That's the one yeah. that's really really narrow next to Lucky's. So yeah. this project's not going to solve that. No, this project will solve the the corner situation on right. Congress Street um, and, the curb, okay. and the curb ramps there. All right. So well, it's important we, to have expectations um, <laughs> appropriate. So that's why I was asking. What about Lucky's, um, Deneen? Like, because that's even more narrow, I believe. Yeah, it is. That. Yeah. What do What do we get there? Kevin, can you talk to um, Can you talk to the yeah. dimensions? So obviously, it's it's horrible day today, and we're going to do wherever we can to make it better at the intersection. I believe the sidewalk was is it four feet or four and a half feet today, which is uh, uh, pretty ridiculous, particularly lucky. And it's there. also slanted. Yeah, so um, I'm not I'm not sure if there's an area way right there, but that's another thing we'll look into. Um, yeah. So while we're focused on the intersection, yeah, that that has come up. We did have our traffic engineer and the team look at the possibility of removing one of the turn lanes, which we can't do because of traffic volumes. But we're trying to see what we can do to um, anything we can do to make the the corners of the intersection on either side of A Street work better than today. So um, I see. Yep. 
I think what we're proposing right now, again, it wouldn't run all the way to the alley, but we'd have a minimum five foot sidewalk on both sides, which is still not ideal, but um, at least yeah. it would be accessible. Um, and you're not moving the light poles. Oh, that we most likely are um, within probably 50 feet of the intersection. We'll, um, I think there are two or three light poles that would have to, that, yep. may, uh, that may be in play that could get okay. replaced as part of this project, but we wouldn't be going all, right. all the way to the, to the bridge over right. uh, Summer okay. Street. I understand. Yep. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, another hand up. We do have, so before we get, I, I know that Thomas had to leave, but he did want to, um, he did have a question about um, if the bike lanes are separated by curb from the street and the sidewalk. Um, and I, um, it's a pretty quick question that um, maybe Jeff, you could answer or Denine or yes. Kevin. Yes. Um, just just to kind of let everybody know. Um, yes, the bike lanes um, will be at the roadway level. Um, and in one section, they'll be separated by um, a raised curbed um, buffer. Um, and a set in, in the other section, um, they'll be separated by um, pavement marking. So a pavement marking buffer with um, flex post um, and, and more, more likely like modular curb um, connected to it. Um, so that they, they will be separated, they will have um, their own space and it will be clearly delineated. Um, so like when you're entering the bike lane um, along Cong Congress Street, you will definitely know. Um, no surprises. Um, and the reason why we have some places with a built uh, barrier and other places without, you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, so, I, so from my understanding, I, I believe there. Denine, you might need to jump in and yeah. jump into this, but I, I think yeah. there, there might have been some some utility issues or it's actually a space, it's a space limitation. Um, the area that is west of A Street, we have the um, we have the, the width from curb to curb to put in a wide enough bike lane so that the city can maintain the bike lane and still have kind of a median separation or a raised separation. As we head, it starts out that way east of A Street, but as we, we head farther east and they're actually turning lanes and more traffic, we don't have more traffic lanes. We don't have the width to have the bike lane be wide enough for the city's maintenance and the raised uh, buffer. So um, in that case, we have a more narrow bike lane you know, the area in between is flush um, that allows the city to maintain it. And there are the flex posts as um, Jeffrey mentioned. So it's just a space constraint. Okay. I agree. All right, uh, back to Tom. Hi, thanks. Um, so the, the only thing I wanted to follow up on was the uh, the poll that you guys took. And the reason that I'm saying it is because I know, um, I, I think your last meeting was in March or something. And since then, I know my whole building has uh, had their parking lot taken away. So we went to a parking lot on Farnsworth and that just had a meeting about uh, being torn down and, uh, and labs being built there. So that's, which I'm sure we'll go through, which is another, uh, you know, whole parking structure that's going to be eliminated. So I'm just asking, I personally like the, uh, I mean, I like the option B. I thought that was good, but um, but I just want to make sure, you know, voices are heard in terms of what is actually going to happen here because um, parking might be a lot more important to my neighbors than uh, bike lanes or wider side. I mean, you know, everybody wants wider sidewalks, but uh you know, if it, if it was just in the meeting, I don't know how well attended it was, but um, that's it. I just want to kind of speak for people that might not know this is really going on or aren't paying attention right now and don't realize this is going on. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tom. And that's uh, completely valid uh, to bring that up. And yeah, I think the way I see this playing out is we're going to continue to um, to solicit from the neighborhood, like every voice and well, what the disparate um, 
you know, priorities that people have and what their perspective might be. And it could be very important for people to have, you know, available uh, curbside space. So, um, yeah, the, the, the first meeting, it was, um, I think, I don't know, maybe we had like about 80 or so. It fluctuated up and down. It, it was good. It was a really good, uh, well-attended um, but you know, we're not going to stop there. We, um, we have a lot of work to do and there's, you know, a ways to go in terms of developing the designs and getting approvals from everybody. So, um, we're going to be out in the neighborhood. We're going to be soliciting information. It's available, um, you know, electronically on our webpage, uh, different, uh, media email, and, you know, we'll, we'll continue to publicize what we're doing. We don't want anything to come back and bite us where we weren't uh, reaching everybody and we weren't transparent. So appreciate that comment. And, um, you know, I'm glad you were on the call tonight. Any, any more hands up any more um, as we approach eight o'clock and I know uh, Jeff needs to get to cell station to hop on a commuter train. We're not going to have a sleepover here. If he misses the train, we're going to have to just, we'll just stay the night. We might as well. We have to be here first thing in the morning. So uh, we, we covered the chat. We covered the, the raised hands. And uh, we let everyone know um, to share the um, fact that we held this meeting tonight. They can, they can see the plans. Uh, they can see the recording. They can just go through the slideshow. They can email, call call their congressman, whatever they need to do uh, to make their voices heard. So um, we by June 17th, it would be great to have feedback from everybody so that we can kind of digest everything uh, in a timely manner. So um, unless there's any other uh, questions that people wanted, we could, we could call it, um, say adieu until the next time and happy Memorial Day. <laughs> and um you know enjoy this pleasant weather that we've been experiencing and we will be hard at work on this project and be reaching out to everyone uh we should have i think we get downloaded kind of the the chat gets downloaded and please sign up uh on the web page too for notifications everyone that participated tonight uh hopefully we have a record of um everyone that we can, we can reach out to that participated. So you're always up to date on what's going on and the progress we're making. All right. Okay. With that, Thanks, then I'll say good night.